today's presentation because we do have a guest speaker, um, Ricardo Rangel from Hertz, that is going to be uh, presenting as well alongside us. And so we're very excited about that today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce your keynote speakers today. And before I introduce them, I just want to cover a few logistics. The presentation is 45 minutes in length, and then we will save the last 15 minutes to answer your questions, because that's where a lot of the really good content happens and a lot of the good uh, information is shared. So in the GoToMeeting, you'll see a question box. And if at any point during the presentation you have a question, feel free to type it in there and submit it. And so we'll gather those questions throughout the presentation, and then we'll address those in the end, the last 15 minutes. Okay, with that, let me go ahead and introduce our speakers. Ricardo Rangel, Senior Director of Data Architecture at Hertz Global. Ricardo is the lead data architect for Hertz Global with over 20 years experience in the data management space. He is currently working on implementing the global data program for Hertz, which includes governance, master data, data integration, and analytics. Uh, no uh, short order there. <laughs> he has a computer systems engineering degree, and he has always been in the data space for the travel and hospitality industry, having worked with Enterprise Group, Hilton Worldwide, and most recently, and obviously, it's global. Ricardo is joined by Solomon Williams, Director of Enterprise Data Management at Data Source Consulting. Solomon is the head solution strategist for data source consulting for EDM with over 20 years of experience with an emphasis in enterprise data architecture, master data management, service oriented architecture, data governance, data quality, data integration, and data warehousing. And he works very closely with the data source consulting customers to implement and support their enterprise initiatives. With that, welcome everyone. We're very excited to have you here, and I'm going to go ahead and transition to Mr. Solomon Williams. Uh, and hello, everybody. This is Solomon again, uh, and thank you, Deborah, for that wonderful and glowing uh, introduction for Ricardo and myself. I just wanted to give just a brief uh, overview of the uh, material of what you're going to hear. Uh, today, we are spotlighting a key customer of ours that is <coughs> actually in the midst of delivering this very unique and transformative program. Uh, the gentleman that we are being joined with really is, uh, this is his brainchild with regard to the data strategy and the data platform and how this entire transformation takes place. And rather, again, to just make this a little bit different, we wanted you to hear from someone that's actively going through this transformation. This is more than just a case study where you're looking backward, but we really wanted to hear, wanted you to hear from an actual, from a person that's actually going through this, um, their perspective, their uh, insights, what they've learned, how it's being managed, so you can really make this tangible and, and tie it to home. So without further ado, I'm not going to belabor this. I'm going to introduce Mr. Ricardo Rangel. All right. Thank you very much, Solomon. Thank you, Deborah. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar about uh, a little bit about our experience on this data transformation, master data, and governance within Hertz. I would like to start this conversation with um, a little bit of history around who we are, right? So Hertz is um, it's a rental car company. Um, if anybody has been in any kind of travel situation, you know that you, you, know, you book a flight, you get into an airport and you need to get a, a car to take you to the hotel or your meeting space and then you return that car, um, Hertz place in that space. Uh, we've been in business for next year, I think we're celebrating 100 years of being in operation. So the, the, actually the first rental cars that you, that Hertz, um, was in business with are those cars that look like in the very old movies, um, you know, that you have to actually, you know, kind of almost push them around so that they can actually go ahead and, and move around. But um, we are um, operating globally, uh, over 36,000 employees worldwide. Um, we have um, three major brands, Hertz, Dollar, and Thrifty. We operate with partnership with additional brands in Europe, uh, Firefly, in Australia, we have Ace. 
So we, we have a very, you know, very international global footprint around the, the rental car industry. We are, um, as you can see, we are a corporate headquarters and we are the ones that actually consolidate all the information and all the data worldwide. So uh, just to give you an example, our, our loyalty profile database is about 100 million customers. And that does not include everybody that has made a transaction with Hertz. It only includes people that actually want to build profiles with us. So, we have a very interesting and very detailed um, customer base around the world, and we are now operating globally uh, with about 700,000 vehicles at any given point in time that are you know, being moved around, either rented or in a body shop, or they are actually being sold to a, a specific customer. So what do we need to transform? Um, this is a, it's a great question. Uh, like I mentioned before, we are a very old company, 100 years old, and throughout this time, it grew by, you know, organic acquisition. It grew by, you know, really being some, some one of the first companies that actually had a booking engine that actually had the systems in the back end to be able to process data, reservations, transactions, and whatnot. And all those systems were, you know, you know, as the web started to come into place in the picture, you know, how do we integrate the, the, our digital requirements to our, our backend systems? Um, we had to do so many workarounds to make all these new things work that we reached a point where we could no longer innovate. Um, we are, takes us a lot of time to change or add a new project or product just because the amount of systems that are in sitting between are, are so expensive and the communications and the, the hard coding that goes with that is just you know, very, very cumbersome. So instead of doing that, we decided to do a, a global transformation. Let's bring in all those systems to the cloud with a cloud first um, strategy. We wanted to make sure that we had a you know, buy versus build mentality. So if there was somebody in the market that had a fleet management system or a booking engine or a transactional system or CRM, we do not want it to reinvent the wheel. Instead, we want to make sure that we, we leverage that knowledge that somebody else was doing the innovations and we want to make sure that we adjust that to our business processes so that we are you know, successful in that endeavor. So that's why, why we decided to build this transformational. Uh, we needed to make sure that we were positioned in a way that now we can um, innovate going forward. So we're no longer stuck by and, and giving the, the business the excuse that, oh, we, we can't do this product because our systems are not able to handle it. We need to change that. So few key goals of this transformation. Um, primarily, is, we want to enable a, a good personal experience. That's why we not named it customer to cash. Um, customer is our number one focus. We need to make sure that they understand that we understand what is it that they want from a service perspective from a vehicle perspective from an experience perspective uh, we need to make sure that we enable our ourselves our customer care all of our employees to have one single view of the data um, we need to make sure that all of our systems were global by nature that we're able to adapt to multiple languages that you're able to run um, regardless of their you know, physical and geographical location. And then we need to make sure as well that our, our fleet management systems was, was comprehensive enough to manage our fleet. Um, like I mentioned before, we have, you know, thousands and thousands of vehicles that are moving all over the place. And now with telematics and the ability to actually capture more information from, from the vehicles, um, new requirements are coming out to place and we need to make sure that we're able to satisfy those requirements. So, in, in that, we went with a cloud-based modern infrastructure that we want to build, right? So how do we make sure that our, our cloud strategy is sound, that we are no longer you know, bound to a data center, that we are able to, um, that we're able to deliver things quickly and better for, for our customers uh, externally and for our business partners as well internally in, in the meantime. So the MDM uh, and data program started based on that um, strategy, basically. It was, we're, we're going cloud first. We need to make sure that now 
all of our business processes are, are going to go to the cloud and we need to make sure that we have the right data available to the right um, systems, consumers, um, information technology, um, CRM, transactional systems, et cetera. And that kind of required us to build a good data strategy for that cloud, right? Um, we need to make sure that all of those requirements were not just IT based, but also business based so that um, it is no longer, we're, we're trying to switch the, the ownership of the data from IT, which is the primarily the case today, to our business consumers, so that they're able to really get the quality of data that they, that they need to have. And then the enterprise, um, you know, we needed to make sure that we're able to, to get the right scope to make sure that um, being such a large program and a large implementation that we're not uh, boiling the ocean, right? So if we were to gather all the requirements from all the different functional areas, we knew that it was gonna be, you know, a very complicated project. And at the same time, we're changing everything in the back end, so those requirements can get very complex very easily. So we needed to make sure that we have uh, achievable scope that we're able to, to deploy incrementally and that we're able to have the right resources to support that going forward. So with that, our data program was, um, in this slide, as you can see, um, our data program was, was started as a foundational program within all the different tracks. Um, we have multiple programs, all of them running at the same time, but data pretty much touches them all. Um, data is, is used by the transactional systems, data is used by our analytical platforms, um, data is, is master for locations, for vehicles, for customers, and they need to reach all these different systems for decision making to make sure that we, they have the right information at their, at, their, at their right time and with the right governance in place. So um, we are working hard to make sure that we, we are in, engaged with all those different programs so that we understand all the different requirements across the board and at the same time, we need to make sure that we deliver, you know, functional data program and governance that allows us to stand up our master data, stand up our integration platform, stand up our analytics, and, and keep the business going uh, going forward. So the vision was set from the beginning that we were not going to, you know, use a lot of stuff in the data center. We definitely needed to to make sure that we look at every option out there in the cloud. So, you know, give you a good example, our Salesforce implementation. Um, we had a, an in-house CRM system that was developed throughout the years. Um, it was, you know, it, it was good for, for, for what it did, but when you look at all the functionality that the Salesforce platform in the cloud has, and this is not a pitch for Salesforce, but there are all the CRMs in the cloud that will actually, you know, work for different use cases. For us, Salesforce was the one that made the most sense, but instead of innovating in that space and recreating the wheel, we decided let's go ahead and just use Salesforce, send our data back to that platform and then push it forward. And we're doing that across the board. We're doing that with the financial platform. We're doing that with our um, analytics. We're gonna do that with our transactional systems and, 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 and sorry, sorry, Simon, you say? Well, yeah, I just wanted to point out, Ricardo, if you could just highlight just briefly, as folks can see on the webinar, that when you're talking about your cloud strategy, it's not just one cloud. Correct. It's multiple clouds. And I, I know I just wanted to know if you could just point out just some of the, um, some of the key points in going with multiple clouds and trying to integrate those multiple clouds. That ex excellent point. Um, when, when we're talking about um, a, a large enterprise, there are many functions that happen within that enterprise. And there, the new mantra that we're trying to embrace is software as a service, right? So in, in, in that model, software as a service, you find out who out there has a, a service that you really want to use versus something that you want to develop and deploy. So your cloud is, no, is not just you know, going into uh, AWS or Azure and setting up a VM and then installing your software there. That's not really what we want to do. We want to leverage as much services as possible. And that requires that, you know, not one cloud is going to satisfy them all, right? So Salesforce is very good at CRM, but you cannot send a VM there. And you may have other functions that you can do there, but it will not satisfy your entire enterprise. Um, so we, 
actually looking at the Oracle ERP for our Oracle Cloud for our ERP. We are looking at you know other HR solutions for our cloud, you know, workforce management. We're looking for services around um, a company called Infor that did a, that has fleet management system as well as uh, reservations and, and transactions all offered as a service so that we're not really you know uh, buying uh, or having to code and manage the VMs and the hardware and infrastructure so with a very lean IT organization we want to make sure that we that we leverage as much as that as possible and part of our our platform or data integration strategy accommodates for that so that we know that a business process will touch multiple clouds at any given point in time and we need to make sure that we had a a sound strategy to make sure that all the data is flowing to the right cloud at the right time in real time. Thank you. Um, a little bit about reference architecture uh, for people to, I think this is very, very, very high level, right? So um, we have a lot of applications today in our data center. Uh, we standardize our integration layer to make sure that everything, whether it's migration or integration, goes to a single platform. That allows us to reuse a lot of business rules and, and processes and connections so that uh, we told all the different teams that they were not allowed to just create point-to-point -point connectivity between their systems to, to do those integrations. Instead, everything goes through an integration layer, including our master data. Then our master data, you know, sits, it's governed, it has certain functions, we have location, we have vehicle, we have customers. That is going to also integrate in that, with that integration layer so that it can feed both the analytical environment as well as have real-time connectivity to our applications that we're standing up in the cloud. So a little bit about our MDM approach. Um, we are implementing a, a B2C customer domain. Uh, we need to make sure that our MDM hub is able to identify uh, identify the unique customer, the actual individual that is doing a transaction with us, and that we're able to associate that with the, with the profile of that customer. So did that, that person rented to Hertz? Did it rent it to Dollar Thrifty? Did it came from a car sales experience? Was he at a parking lot in one of their uh, rental car locations? We, we, that kind of helps us um, know who you are so that we can give, give our customers a better experience because now we remember them and we're able to tailor both our marketing and our messaging as well as our experience to making sure that they feel like that they're welcome in any of the Hertz brand uh, locations. That This is also going to enable us to work in, in, in unison with a lot of other systems to really be able to provide that customer 360 degree view. Um, MDM by itself does not give you that. MDM in our strategy is one of the components of, of that 360 degree review. Um, we are partnering with Salesforce, with MDM, with our um, application data integration layer, as well as some loyalty providers and, and data providers that allows us to build that comprehensive 360 degree review of the customer. Another one of our domains is location. Um, you know, we have at any point in time, more than 11,000 locations worldwide, and that is just the rental locations. We also have headquarters, we have parking garages, we have body shops, we have uh, locations where vehicles are dropped, and knowing where a vehicle is at any given point in time is a, it's a critical endeavor for, for our IT department. So we, all of our location data was spread all over the place. You have very little governance. We were not able to to really understand, you know, when we're opening our location, what were all the departments and the people that we need to know about it. And the same case happened when we close a location. We, all of the departments that are involved in that were, were completely disconnected. Um, our MDM implementation is taking care of that. It's creating all the workflows, all the management of every location so that everybody that needs to know about a location and every system that needs to know about a location, you know, is engaged in that process. To give you an example, one of the things that we're alleviating today is that um, we've had cases where we close a location and a year later, we're still paying for the electric bill. Um, somebody forgot to notify the, the department that takes care of that and we just continue to pay the bill. A restaurant moved over to that location and all of a sudden we're paying the electric bill for that restaurant. So that's just one example of what happens when your data is not 
connected through our enterprise. Our next domain is vehicle. Um, we are um, mastering our vehicle information. Um, as you know, vehicle is, is the, the main product that, that we use when, uh, when you're renting a car. So we want to know every option, every highlight, every color of every vehicle that we have out there. And we, not only for our internal operations, but we want our customers to also know about what, are, what is in that vehicle, right? So you're renting this car, is this a green car? You know, what's the miles per gallon? You know, how long is it going to go with X amount of gas? So we want to ha have all that information available for our customers as well so that we can drive not, not such, you know, we, we want to drive a better customer experience, but we also want to understand what are the preferences from our customers so that we can now fix our fleet to, to give the, the vehicles that our customers want. And the next thing is um, we have on our backlog um, B2B customer, and that's our, our, our accounts. You know, when, when you have an, a, a corporate contract with Hertz, um, there's, you know, you, you may include your insurance, you may include, you know, all your employee, get a, a, a specific standard rate across the globe. Um, that's what, that's another domain that we have in our backlog for 2018, as well as our chart of accounts and finance. Make sure that um, we have a way and the processes to manage all of our chart of accounts globally, and that every financial system and every interim system in between knows about any changes on chart of accounts as well. Now, Ricardo, when you speak about the uh, MGM overall, uh, one of the things I know that you and I have had conversations about was uh, for a company this large and transformation, the MGM solution doesn't provide by itself the 360-degree view of the customer. Right. It enables it. Could you just give your perspective on how MDM supports or enables that 360 degree view. And I mean, you have a, a particular phrase that I love about the pane of glass. If, right. if you could help share that. So we, when we talked about 360 degree view of a customer, um, there are many flavors of that. There are many ways to implement a 360 degree view of a customer, right? You can put all of your customer data in one place and make sure that everything and everybody is feeding that one place so that you are able to know exactly what that customer is doing. In our case, that was simply not possible, right? So we have customer data that's going to be on Salesforce. We have the master data that allows us to uniquely identify you running on a, on a master data hub with EBX5. We have transactional data that, you know, all the reservations, transactions. We have survey data about the people that actually respond to surveys. We have complaints that are in customer care running on a Salesforce instance. If you, for whatever reason, you, you crash the vehicle, then we have a, a, a vehicle damage system that has all that information. So it was really impossible to, to say, now we're going to enable in real time all that information to flow into one single, in single space. Instead, what we decided to do was uh, implement a single pane of glass concept. And through Salesforce, because that's, gonna, that's where our single pane of glass is going to be, Salesforce is going to enable us to connect all those different systems and present that 360 degree view of the customer. So that MDM tells us exactly who you are and all relationships, and then we're able to pull from the Hertz data, your transactions, from dollar, your transactions, from the, the vehicle damage system, you know, if you ever had an accident, from your um, our Medali integration to see whether you have, you know, responded to a survey, whether you liked the experience or you hated it, all that information is, is now connected through that single pane of glass on, on the Salesforce instance. So would it be just wise to say that it's not enough just to understand the benefits and the value of master data management, but how your company, how you're individually going to make use of that MDM solution and, tie, and how that ties into your overall data strategy. Correct. And, and that is a journey that every company must make on their own. They have to make that decision. Um, in other instances of previous lifetimes, we probably would have done something different because either the systems allowed us to do something else or the information was more aggregated or maybe you actually needed to have uh, you know, multiple systems feeding the MDM and MDM needed to have a lot more of the information. Uh, but this particular case, this is a strategy that, that we decided. And that was a decision made by not just IT, it was all of our business stakeholders as well. Uh, making 
getting to the understanding that yes, you will get all the data and you have your 360 review of the customer, but you, you we will not put it, everything on MDM. So the burden of having that be on MDM was taken away. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Right. The other thing that we're also working on is um, reference data, right? So this is a key component. Um, I call this one a domain on its own. Um, reference data is, um, you know, the, the country codes and descriptions, geographic zone, you know, the currency, languages, dialects, things like that. Um, it's very important because, believe it or not, things like country codes get lost in translation between many, many different systems. Uh, we at HERS actually have an implementation where we kind of bastardize a country code, and we have a code that GB could mean either Great Britain or Germany, and it creates a heck of a lot of confusion with our business users and customer care, people that are dealing with data because they don't know what to do when, when things like that happen. So we are standardizing a lot of standards, um, not just around country codes and descriptions, but, but also travel industry standards, right? So we bring into our Master Data Hub, uh, standards on zip codes, standards on, on vehicle information, standards of airports and travel industry specific related information, and we are enabling all of the other systems with those standards so that they don't have to make their own. Um, a little bit about data governance, right? So all of this is great, but if you don't have a governance structure in place to manage it, um, it most likely I'm not going to say you're going to fail, it's going to be very, very difficult, right? So um, we, we currently have a, a very centric data center operation. Right now, we're in the midst of this transformation where we're going to have part of our operations running on a data center, part of our operations running on the cloud. And in the future, we're going to have pretty much everything running on the cloud. And in some instances, we're still going to have not really a data center, but more of a, a, a place a co-location center where we actually need to put physical inventory because we just need to keep that to keep the business running. Uh, in order for that, you need to make sure that you have the right processes in place, you have the right communication, um, you have a data governance structure that allows you to manage all this information, especially during the interim stage where there's a lot of confusion, not just between IT, but also between our business users and the, and everybody else that, you know, where is all this going? How is the data going to flow? How am I going to do my job, make sure that the, the data is, is correct and that I'm able to, to make the right decisions? So we, we stood up a governance framework, uh, very out of the box. Um, you know, the strategy that we followed was since Hertz did not have a data governance structure, which is went out to DAMA, downloaded our, you know, the, framework that they suggested and we implemented that to, to do that. So um, we started working on that governance approach. We are embedding now all of those data processes across the board. We are making sure that the, the, the governance structure is what drives the decisioning and, and a lot of the implementation decisions around how we manage the data and how it gets to the right customer. Um, we need to make sure that we also have a common language. I think that was the big, one of the biggest governance programs that we started at the beginning thinking that, hey, we, we, we need to standardize a lot of our own terminology and it ended up being one of the most successful uh, deliverables of this program. Uh, we sat down with key stakeholders from many, many different departments and we started standardizing our, our language. You know, what do we call our customers? What do we call our locations? What are the attributes that are important from a vehicle? And customer perspective and out of those discussions um, actual deliverables to make sure that the systems are able to reflect that are being put in place today okay so with that um, I'll jump into the lessons learned because this is this is something that we're actually um, still learning from it right because we are not done with this program we are um, I would say that the vast majority of our, our data deliverables are by the end of this year, but the majority of the systems um, that we're migrating at the same time have a deliverable of 2018. Um, we have a global rollout plan. Um, curiously enough, yesterday we had a, a very long session, almost three hours, 
with all the key program stakeholders in deciding how we're going to roll this up uh, globally. So it is not just the data and master data, it was around data and systems and the change management and the training and all that. Uh, and we discuss every possible option. So to give you an example, one of, one of the things that we were talking about yesterday is can we do an island first? You know, we, we localize the island, we know exactly that they cannot send that vehicle outside of that island and you know, we have one system there and maybe we, we get it off there. But then we said, you know, maybe that's not a good use case uh, because there's no islands here in North America and that really represents the, big, the, the, the biggest channel. So how do we do it uh, based on zones, you know, based on time zones, based on um, geographical areas, do we deploy in the summer, do we deploy in the winter, or are there any blackout dates when it comes to operation. So all of those things need to be considered for that. And we know that at the beginning, we have a vision that is not really very straight and nobody's very clear about it. Um, but as we start iterating and delivering different things, that vision starts to become a reality. So um, that's been applied for all of the programs and NDM is not an exception. We are making sure that we deliver through uh, different iterations, different functionalities. We know that um, being able to deliver a big ban approach and all NDMs just deliver and, and move forward is, is not something that's going to be happening, right? We, we need to evolve with the different requirements of the system and we're building iterations to, to build that. Um, so we know that what we have today may not be the, the right end deliverable, but we know that we're working with the business to make sure that we adjust and we include the things that they that will make the best deliverable product in the future. Um, we also know that the scope is very important, right? So even though we're saying that we need to adjust as we go along in the journey, um, when we are very clear on the scope, um, it just makes it easier for all the product teams to speak with the truth. Um, we, when you actually know what customer data you're going to be bringing in, then there's no, it's no longer a conversation of people asking, well, do you include this or do you include that? No, this is the scope. This is exactly what we're doing. And making sure that when we change that scope, we have a good way of communicating and understanding the impact of that change so that everybody's aligned and, and there are no misconceptions of what's being delivered. So scope management is, is extremely critical, um, especially in long programs. So we, we started this, this journey a year ago. Um, and we're going to continue on the journey for the next year and a half. So we know that prior teams change, uh, leadership changes. There, there's a lot of change that happens in between. So having a good understanding of that scope is critical to make sure that you're heading in the right direction. Another lesson learned is that cloud is not easy. Um, cloud is um, sometimes being sold as a, a good solution is to say, you know, anybody can go in and set up a data center in the cloud if you have the right expertise start using Salesforce right away or start using this and that. And the, the reality is that it may be true that for a small you know, engagement or it could be true if you're doing just a POC or something like that, but when you're enabling an entire enterprise worldwide, cloud is not easy. You need to make sure that you have a strategy for cloud. You need to make sure that you have the connectivity, you have the security, you have the network infrastructure to be able to, to support the things that you want to do in the cloud. So, before you jump in the cloud, make sure that, that you understand exactly what you want out of that cloud and you bring in the right people to make sure that you thought of everything that needed to be thought of. Um, don't leave security as the last thing to do. Uh, security is extremely critical, especially when we're talking about customer data and or SOX compliance or PCI. You need to make sure that security is always in place because they are the ones that will be able to see things that you can't see. From a product development perspective, they can give you some guidelines, they can understand how do you need to secure the databases that you're putting on the cloud or the services that you're putting in the cloud, what kind of monitoring you need to have in place. So all of that needs to be correctly planned out. So if you leave them for last, then you may delay your projects or you may put your data at risk. Remember that now your data is on the cloud. So you need to make sure that it's protected uh, by, by the best standards possible. Um, another thing that we discovered is that, you know, it, during this transition state, and because we're doing iterations across the board, um, we have legacy systems that have 
old data. And those legacy environments are gonna, some, a lot of them are keep on running. So there's a transition state for data. Um, we, we understand that you know, we're creating new codes or we're standardizing or we're cleaning country codes, but that old GB code is still gonna exist in some system. And we need to make sure that that system keeps running correctly until we're able to decommission it. So um, part of our master data management strategy is that we need to make sure that that actual hub has the capacity of maintaining the old code. We have the right mapping so that you can go backwards and support the legacy environment, but also with a view on the future and, and um, making sure that you understand how that data is going to evolve into a much better quality quality data. Then don't, under, don't underestimate, sorry for the word, uh, system decommissions. Um, killing a system is harder than it looks. We learned that by, by experience, um, getting a, a system not just disconnected, but also making sure that you're meeting audit requirements, making sure that you are able to archive the information, engage the legacy environments that all of a sudden are able to actually unplug the system, or you're taking off you know, a database offline and then you realize, that, oh my God, there was another application that was running there and it was running another database. So um, system decommission is, is a priority on its own. It should be treated as a priority. You should have dedicated project managers and people involved in making sure that you decommission the, the systems correctly. And you need to make sure that you have a, a strategy around data decommission as well. Because for audit requirements, especially in our case, we need to make sure that even when we decommission the system, we need to put that data in place for a, for a given period of time to be able to satisfy any audit requirements. Then change management. Um, this one is, I would, put it in red or yellow, highlight it as possible. Change management is critical on any major program. Uh, have a good partnership with change management and having the ability to communicate what's going on, where is it going, how is it gonna impact your business, how is it gonna impact timelines, how is it gonna impact you know, how everybody does something. It's critical for the success of a program. Uh, so a good change management strategy is just to be able to communicate is, is critical. And then lastly, product methodology, right? So um, in, in programs, in our experience, what we learned was um, everybody was doing their own methodology and that when you bring them all together, it's just very hard to see where the, the dependencies are, right? So you have a product team that's running Agile, you have a product team that's running Waterfall, and then within Agile, there are many flavors of Agile, who's doing what, and making sure that you're able to tie that to the PMO is critical. And it's just, it's better to decide at the beginning of a, a large transformation, how you're gonna manage the projects and what is the strategy so that everybody aligns to that and everybody is able to, to deliver the, uh, the right dependencies and the right project planning for, for the program. And with that, um, I can wrap it up, uh, send back to, well, before you do that, um, and I didn't make a job, but I, I got a couple of questions of some things uh, that I just would, I think that you, you, we might be able to just give a little bit more insight around. Uh, and, and just from your perspective and having done this, when you were working on the cloud data strategy, uh, how would you say that your data strategy for cloud differed than a data strategy for on-premise? It can just like one or two things that you may want to think of differently or think about a little differently. So I, I would say that the governance strategy would be the same. Okay. Right. So from a data governance perspective, the the rules and procedures, the policy, the structure, the modeling, the architecture standards, they're exactly the same, whether you're doing cloud or on premise. When when you're doing a cloud first strategy, your, your key component in my head is, is your integration, right? So your data no longer lives in one data center and where it's accessible or it should be easily accessible to all the applications that reside on the same data center. Mm -hmm. And latency and you know being different clouds and security and all those things now start to play a, a bigger role than it used to do before, right? Okay. So, you can no longer, for instance, you know, if, you have, if you're building a new data warehouse and you have a, an application that's gonna feed that, getting that data on the data center into the data warehouse is relatively simple because you, you know the network, you're able to connect 
to it directly and it's fast or if it's not fast, you can figure out a way to make it fast. But when you have in cloud, then you have physical limitations that are now sit in between, right? So you have a Salesforce instance with all of your customer data and you have a data warehouse that is running somewhere else, whether on-premise or here, you have a physical limitation now that says your data cannot move from one place to another with you. Um, another thing that we that we are learning is that a lot of these cloud applications um, don't allow bulk movement of data. It's more API driven, you know, transactional based, which is good because now it's kind of forcing us to say, hey, you know what? Forget batch. We need to make sure that all of our data starts to migrate and integrate in real time across the board, including data warehouses and things like that. So in a sense, it's forcing us to rethink how we integrate data. Instead of thinking all batch, now everything is more around how do we make sure that it's real time, including the data warehouses as well. No, no, thank you, Ricardo. I just wanted to give just a little bit more insight to that. Uh, if you wanted to wrap and get that back to Deborah. Sure. Okay. All right, so um, Deborah, it's all you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Ricardo and Solomon. It's so informative. And, you know, one of the, the most interesting points, I think, for me in listening to your presentation is, is your point about not going from the old to big bang new, that you should plan for an interim stage. To me, I think, I think that that is just such powerful advice, given the complexity and the size of, of what you guys are going through. I think that that's really a a good carry through for some other folks that might be considering similar types of initiatives. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, the first one, uh, this is probably best suited uh, for you, Solomon, is, you know, sometimes people have a, a way of thinking that some of, because there is a lot of similarities between data warehousing, right? You've got data integration, you've got um, transformation, one of the questions is, you know, can those skill sets, the data warehouse skill sets, do you feel like they're transferable with MDM initiatives, or are they just drastically different? Well, no, and uh, that is a good question. There is some overlap, right? Uh, but to your point, there's the integration, there's the data movement, there's the data modeling and architecture. Those skill sets are, are, are not uh, useless, I would say, but the approach with master data management and data warehousing is a little different and it will drive out a, a, a different skill set or a different tier of those same skill sets if you will when you consider data warehousing data warehousing is really at the end of the data stream uh, the operational processes have executed the transactions have been logged and you're pulling that data into an environment that's better used for analytics for you know distribution of data in a bulk format or in reports and what have you. But with master data management, particularly operational MDM, there are so many moving parts. There's the business process, there's the integration, there's the data model itself that's not necessarily the same as a standard uh, OLTP or Oper online transaction processing database. There are nuances to it, the reference data management component, the hierarchy management, that's where there's a real differentiation and then you get to the integration aspect of it and how those data movements need to be architected how they're going to flow how they're going to drive business processes that's where you really get into the differentiation so short answer there are some of those skills that absolutely can be brought to bear but there is uh at the end, uh, as you get more into it, a, a significant divergence between those data warehousing skill sets and MDM skill sets. Yes, there is a difference. Great, thanks, Solomon. Next question is uh, goes out to you, Ricardo. Um, you know, I can only imagine the complexity of of doing this kind of uh, lift and shift with a 100 year old global company. And uh, like you say, business transformation, so cloud and uh, rental and uh, vehicle care and vehicle location, so many points of integration for all these different systems. And like you said, changing some of the back office solutions um, in parallel, right? So what was, what was your strategy going into this um, with all of these interdependencies and integration points how did you get in front of that and how do you continue to stay in front of it as this project tips the, the, the halfway point and starts to 
come into its final stages? Great question. Um, we have a, a dedicated PMO task force that is basically managing the program overall. And within that, one of the, one of the key roles there is, is the person that is dedicated only to manage all the interdependencies, right? So, because we have a major program that requires, you know, master data needs to be available for our digital website to get location data, but then um, digital needs to be able to feed information into a data integration stream so that all the reservations make it in time for our booking engine. So it, it, you can imagine the amount of integration that, that, that goes along all these different major systems, and each one of them has a different track. They are they are managed by you know data sources implement our NBM. We have Accenture, we have Deloitte, we have boutique systems uh, firms. So we, there's a lot of interaction with many different groups. So having a key dedicated role just to manage those integrations is is very important. The other one is change management. Change management um, is, is is the key group that communicates with business users and stakeholders and everybody else. Um, change management is, is an art, in my opinion. The, the, the ability to communicate a message is something that, in my case, for instance, I'm an IT guy, and I am really bad at that, right? So I talk in IT terms, and as long as people are in IT, I know that they can understand me. But if I sit in front of a marketing department, th their language is completely different, right? Sales, their language is completely different. Finance is the same thing. So change management is a group that's dedicated to making sure that we get the right message out. They, they create the plans, they create the, the engagement, they, they connect the stakeholders, and they're able to implement those communications plans to make sure that everybody's aware of what's going on, how it's gonna impact the system, how it's gonna impact their jobs, when things are gonna happen, how they're gonna be trained and all that. So change man management is another critical role that, that we need to have in place to make sure that all of this moves along. And Ricardo, if you don't mind, I'd like to piggyback just on that slightly, because I don't think that there's one subtle point that may get missed, and that is, uh, from my perspective, the one owner. So Ricardo has the ownership of the data program, end to end, globally, so that even though we, we are communicating across the board with these other vendors, uh, we have that escalation path that if we need a final decision, we can bubble us up to Ricardo, Ricardo, what is this gonna be? What is the decision here? And that is a key component, uh, particularly to these enterprise data transformations. There has to be an escalation path, that governance, and that decision-making ability. So I just wanted to point that out, that I think that from uh, what we've seen in a lot of engagements, where you don't have that one dedicated ownership to the data program, there's generally imbibes a lot of risk. Right. And I just wanted to point that out. Yep, great point. Great, thanks, thanks, Solomon. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, next question, uh, the, the questions are starting to flood in. Um, how instrument, this is probably for you, Ricardo, how instrumental was the ability to get the organization to get to the point where business processes became repeatable that led to a more efficient data governance model where naming standards and taxonomy conversations made progress and let me know if you need me to read that one more time all right that was a very long question <laughs> <laughs> okay here we go again okay it's a great question too how instrumental was the ability to get the organization to get to the point where business processes became repeatable that led to more efficient data governance model led to a more efficient data governance model where naming standards and taxonomy conversations were starting to make progress? Yeah, great question. So in a way, I think we were a little bit lucky that there was no processes already in place, right? So I, I did not need to adjust existing processes or, or take a, an existing language or existing taxonomy and adjust it to where it needed to be to go in the future. In the specific case of data, um, there was no governance in place. There were no standards. There was no documentation or, or, or all of those. So um, exactly, actually exactly one year ago, we started building all of those. So, and, and we took an approach that said, well, we have nothing. Let's take, 
best practices from the from the industry and try to start with that. Obviously, as you start moving along, you start understanding the culture of the people, the company, and you start adjusting your methodology, how we can communicate, how we can document these processes. And today, we have an extensive list of business processes that have been documented and are governed through our data governance, implemented through our MDM, and that is what's really going to make a difference is that before, um, those processes did not exist. They were, it was very tribal knowledge from all the different departments and, and business groups how to make something happen, and now we have those processes. Those processes are understood, are documented. We need to make sure that they're not set in stone, that the business understands that we can adjust those processes, but at, at a minimum now, we do have them. And, and that, to me, is another great big win of, of this project and this overall transformation. Great, uh, thank you. Very good answer. Um, this next one is it's kind of a the chicken or the egg uh, type of question. Uh, the uh, participant in the audience wants to know what really came first. Was it the decision to move towards cloud, which was followed by MDM, or was there a decision to move towards MDM and cloud followed afterwards? Yep, the decision initially was to move to the cloud. Um, actually, um, I was, when I joined the program, um, that decision was already being made. The, 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 our executive sponsor, the board of HERS, um, approved a direction to upgrade all of our systems and not do it on a data center and instead leverage the cloud to do that. MDM came afterwards because we realized, and, and not just an MDM, a downstream MDM, it's an operational MDM, because I realized that um, you know, if we, if we are going to have four or five major applications running on different clouds and all of them required customer data or vehicle information or location information that if they had to replicate all of that information all over the place, then we were going to replicate what we did in our data center. So the master data actually came after. Um, it was a matter of... Um, showing to our, to our stakeholders, my IT leadership, and, and explaining to them, hey, if we don't do this, we risk that every single copy out there of location data or customer data is gonna get out of sync, is gonna have you know, replicated information that all of a sudden is managed by different groups, and it's not gonna provide the, the one source of truth that we're looking for. So it was a very easy sell afterwards because now your data is, is, is actually spread between clouds, so there was no way to guarantee that those two distinct clouds or three or four were going to have the same information across the board. The only way to guarantee that was to force them not to create a local copy, but instead leverage the master data for it. Excellent. Great. Very good. Um, next question is, what tools have been used for the MDM program? So we're using... Um, company called Orchestra Networks has the tool called, the actual software is called EBX5. Um, we went through an evalu evaluation, we, you know, we, we have different requirements from, um, from all the different groups and we chose Orchestra because it, it gave us a, a very good front end tool for our business users, very user friendly, you know, it, it allows us to build all the workflows, um, it allows us to do the localization, data localization, which is a key component to our to the success of our program. Um, I think maybe because the company is French, they they kind of had that localization already nailed down. So, um, so yeah, the answer is Orchestra Networks with EVX5. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question, um, and I, I think we've got time for this last one, and there's probably about five or six that we won't get to. So what we'll do is we will type the answers to those questions and we'll send it out to everyone that registered uh, for the webinar. So we'll tackle this last question and then we'll close things out so that we stay on time. Next one is, what's your thoughts on the risk of having protected data on the cloud? Very good question. Um, when we think about the clouds, um, we need to think about the Security, security protection and things that go around it to make sure that you actually are able to protect any information that you want to protect. So our security department was actually tasked 
with making sure that any cloud that we were going to do business with or we were going to do a project with met those requirements. And I, I will tell you straight ahead that I'm not a security expert, uh, but I know that we need to protect data. I know that we have to encrypt information. I know that our customer information, we don't want to be in the news and say, hey, somebody logged into your database and all of a sudden was able to, to, uh, to download your, your customer information. So we took Salesforce security guys and they sat down with our security department and we took all of the all the different cloud vendors and they sat down with it. And unless they met minimum requirements, we were not gonna do business with them. Um, security, like I mentioned, is, is, is something that you don't wanna leave for last. You wanna make sure that you embed all that in your business processes. And at the end of the day, when you have that, um, you should be able with a very high degree of confidence be able to say that your data is protected and there's not going to be any issues with that because it, it really becomes kind of a transparent it's an extension to your to your business processes but it requires a partnership with your cloud vendor as well um, we we had to we had a major security with one of our clouds we actually had to stop the implementation and we gave the chance to that particular vendor to up their security standards so that they can actually meet the the minimum requirements for us to actually do business with them so but that that, that requires uh, a separate strategy it requires a dedicated security team that is able to know exactly what they have to do to, to meet those um protections and security guidelines excellent thank you ricardo thank you so much um you know uh we'll go ahead and close things out one of the questions that we're getting asked um we're getting a ton of feedback people have really enjoyed this we've had a lot of thank yous come in and uh, people are asking, gosh, can can we can we get access to this again? I want to I want to hear it again, or I joined late. And the answer is yes. We will be uh, sharing a link to the recording. We will not be sharing the slides per se, but um, for all registrants, we will be sending out a link to the recorded video, so you can have access to that and watch it in your leisure. Um, so with that, let's let's progress to the next slide. Um, I just want to, um, you know, first and foremost, um, thank you, Ricardo. This has been uh, such a great, informative presentation. We really appreciate you taking the time to share with us your journey. Um, so thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Solomon. I know how busy everyone is. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for lending your expertise. And I want to invite all of the participants. Um, please don't miss out on our next educational webinar. It's going to, to be presented by Eric Linneman. He is the cloud competency lead here at DataSource, and he will be sharing his insights on how to modernize your data management um, with the cloud. Um, that's going to be Thursday, September 7th, 11 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. So um, the registration link will be coming shortly, or you can look for it on our website. But again, thank you everyone for participating and look for that email with the link to the video. So have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.